Hello, <clears throat> welcome everyone. Welcome everyone. I can see some of you just uh, logging in at the moment. So uh, I will briefly introduce myself. My name is Dunia and I'm one of the lecturers uh, at SOAS Center for Global Media and Communications. Uh, it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit more about our um, sort of focus today uh, within that center at SOAS, because we have a particular expertise in media and communication, political communication, also digital humanities. Um, some of my colleagues also sort of uh, have more expertise applied to media and development, as well as to the field of journalism. So today I was um, honored to um, present uh, some of the topics, one specific topic to be, uh, to be fair, <laughs> that you will have the chance to, to study, you know, if you, if you join our community. Um, our students usually sort of look into a range of different topics that um, have to do with the question of power, basically how much empowerment, uh, you know, uh, can, we, can we get, can we experience from the media? Alternatively, how much control does the media has on us, you know, like uh, looking into the power structure behind the media and sort of um, how it intersects with, with the sphere of politics. So, um, you know, typically these are the, the kind of uh, sort of general themes that you might be interested in. If you come from literary studies or if you come from political sciences, sociology, um, even if you uh, have a background in development, uh, and you're sort of interested in looking into sort of questions like digital divide or the new forms of digital divide as we see technology evolving and sort of how, uh, you know, um, uh, how we will sort of navigate uh, the challenges that might come with, the, with new media and what are the new forms of kind of uh, inequalities and, and social gaps that, you know, have, that may be um, kind of widen as a result of the development of these new technologies and the ways in which they might be commodified in the future. So um, these are kind of a, a very broad range of questions that we will explore within the field of media. And today um, I had the opportunity to choose one specific topic that um, you know could be uh, kind of um, interesting to explore with you during the session. And I decided to look more specifically into the, the sort of question of digital activism uh, you know, it has been kind of a question that was very kind of trendy within the field of political communication a few years ago, specifically in the early 2010s, because at that moment there was this assumption that, you know, social media would sort of uh, help um, access, um, you know, help um, sort of facilitate access to education, to, uh, you know, uh, information, that it would be a more interactive way to sort of debate and uh, as a result that it could be considered as potentially as a more inclusive form of, of communication when sort of, you know, um, ensuring pluralism within, within the public sphere. These were typically the kind of assumptions that you would hear in the early 2010s, even uh, back in the early 2000s, that was the very beginning of the internet and people were experimenting then with, uh, you know, like um, typically um, kind of blogs and, you know, like um, very, uh, kind of basic type of web pages and um, there was this argument that apparently also in the um, kind of uh, anti-globalization movements of the late 90s you know these these early form of kind of communication had also supported um, anti-globalization movements um, facilitated the logistics of the protest and so on and so forth so you know it, it's kind of funny because every 10 years or so you hear that sort of argument that, wow, a new wave of protests and civil movements seems to be, you know, like sparking everywhere. Arguably, you could say that back in 2019, it was still the case, you know, more recently, because we saw, for example, protests in Hong Kong, Lebanon, in Algeria, in Sudan. So there was a range of different protests, again, sort of um, happening in, in uh, many different countries. And uh, obviously, you know, because uh, a civil society uh, and political dissidents have to come up with very creative ways to use the media, it's always really interesting to see sort of what's the most emergent type of technology that they would be using and what is the most creative form of communication they would be using to, to uh, kind of consolidate a counter discourse and make sure that they, they can sort of circulate their voices, which are kind of more um, uh, kind of um, that that appear to be, you know, an alternative to the mainstream, if you will, you know, they're, they're kind of refreshing, they're counter hegemonic, they're, you know, in that sense, that they are 
kind of innovative and um, and um, creative in that sense. And arguably, the same applies if you think about the ways that they um, that they actually um, uh, that these movements use technology, apply technologies in different contexts. Now, what is really interesting is that as much as this, you know, like was kind of a very you know, like a prevailing argument in the communication literature in the early 2010s, it seems as if, you know, like in recent years, that idea has kind of been on the decline, you know. It's almost as if we've seen sort of technology evolve, evolving uh, recently, and, you know, now there's kind of a lot of um, kind of more of a dystopian view of technology, because we see how, obviously, along with social media, People have been uh, debating and engaging uh, through echo chambers, arguably, you know, that, you know, there's also the, the issue of filter bubbles online, that people remain within their own sort of communities very often. And, you know, um, and a counter argument came up uh, more recently, specifically in political communication that suggested that, you know, as a matter of fact, these technologies can also be detrimental to, um, you know, counter hegemonic voices, because it could be that, um, for example, civil society uh, is exposed to too much polarization. Um, obviously, you also find dominant political voices, leading parties, um, you know, populists, uh, elites that can also use these technologies to spread their own message. And in that sense, we see that um, it's almost as if uh, digital technologies like social media, even encrypted platforms, seem to have emerged, uh, seem, seem to have evolved in a similar way as uh, the traditional mass media that we knew, you know, from years ago, <laughs> decades, decades ago in the past. So obviously, like we found ourselves in this kind of context where people are very anxious about disinformation, you know, like conspiracy theories, uh, whether the information they have access to now is reliable or not. There is this huge debate at the moment, and it's almost kind of making us feel very disillusioned with the idea that these technologies can be still used occasionally in very creative ways to facilitate um, sort of the consolidation of a counter discourse, uh, organized protest, um, and uh, you know, uh, sort of support uh, a more kind of uh, bottom-up grassroots type of mobilization. So obviously, like all of these concepts that you find, you know, like I'm not gonna dive in too much in that because I wanna give you more of a general overview of these questions. I wanna I want you to feel basically how, you know, within the field of communication, we navigate these broader questions of, you know, like what's our relationship with technology? You know, like do we control technology or does technology control us? Kind of these very broad question, which as a matter of fact, it's, you're not gonna, you know, some of you may be uh, very interested in questions about sort of civil movements and political dissent and so on and so forth. Others might be more interested in sort of the top-down perspective, looking into the political economy of the media and how, uh, you know, like um, uh, the elites, the, you know, like the state, the national discourse can use also the media, how it can be used as a form of propaganda. So there are very different sort of perspectives to apply, but across these different sort of uh, topics, these different subjects that are all part of the field of communication, you know, um, I want to sort of give you an overview of some of the questions that come up so that it kind of sparks your curiosity and you want to you want to sort of further explore that. So, of course, there are a range of different concepts that come up that seem very kind of uh, pedantic because, you know, they're, they're framed in this very academic way and they can be quite intimidating sometimes. But you, um, you, you will find that very often it's quite straightforward once you dive in. If you're interested in general with, with, you know, about you're interested in the intersection between sociology, um, you know, like um, social movements, you're interested in that um, particular aspect of, of political sciences, for example, you'll find that it's actually quite straightforward. And with, um, you know, the literature from the early 2010s, so the main question there is how much do does this new sort of age mean, you know, of the media, how much does it, that change? you know, the way we communicate, the way we engage in politics and so on and so forth. And so the emphasis is placed then on information. And it's about the information, how it circulates, as well as the network itself. That it's very much about the networks and who can capitalize on this network, who can build strong linkages within the network. And that is something that will be leveraged, whether it is in politics or even uh, if you think about it um, from the perspective, from an economic perspective, you can think about it 
as you know, uh, you know, linkages that can be commodified typically as it has been the case in social media, for example, right? So if you think about influencers, uh, you know, new, new sort of campaigning as well as marketing practices that evolved over the last 10 years, you, I'm sure you can relate to what I'm describing, right? That sort of idea of a network society, the attention economy, that's another concept that you, know, you might have heard. This idea that now we capitalize on attention. It's all about who can sort of leverage as much as as much attention as possible. And in that in that context, what is really what is really sort of fascinating is that uh, we see the media and these new technologies uh, that you know appear to be at first you know um, at first sight quite um, interactive. It's almost as if they are a double-edged sword, right? Um, that it's always kind of the, the power dynamic is always kind of shifting. And on the one hand, you see obviously sort of uh, leading political voices that are well established in the public sphere that have already potentially a control on the uh, traditional mass media or, uh, you know, that sort of, you know, I, I, obviously I, um, I'm keeping it very vague so you can relate to different examples, but, you know, it's about sort of those who represent, you know, shareholders in the traditional mass media, who are, for example, um, sort of uh, have a, a, a monopoly in terms of ownership over the over the media in general, who have strong ties with tech companies, for example, who can regulate the media in terms of the legal framework, in terms of in terms of media freedom, freedom of the press, for example. Sort of those leading voices may as well, obviously, use the media in their advantage. You know, obviously, uh, you may uh, think about uh, the case of censorship. You may think about the case of uh, surveillance, state surveillance online, for example. Um, and you can also, uh, I'm sure, relate to, uh, for example, situations. Obviously, the Cambridge Analytica scandal is the most obvious case because it has been uh, sort of uh, extensively documented and, and discussed in recent years. But this obviously introduces a large broader range of cases that we know of in a number of countries uh, where um, obviously uh, governments and uh, political elites may uh, gain access to information that you know should that should be basically preserved because it's part of users' privacy. It's an infringement of, of users' privacy, right? So that's one way to look at it. It's you know like the again I'm coming back to this image of the double-edged sword that you know, there's one side of it that is threatening, that represents that control, that sort of uh, potential infringements to new individuals' privacy and, and so on and so forth, freedom of the press. On the one hand, there's also that sort of more kind of empowering side uh, of the media that suggests that, you know, again, if we sort of use it in sometimes more playful, interactive way, um, if it's truly bottom up, then it can be more inclusive and sort of it can be used to draw attention to a cause um, and sort of uh, shift the narrative in a different direction. Um, so we've seen different cases of that, obviously. Um, I mean, perhaps one of the most uh, recent case for those of you who are potentially interested also in the, in the context of the Middle East is the, you know, the um, uh, sort of um, mobilizations online um, uh, dating back from May 2021, um, sort of around the, the sort of Palestinian uh, mobilization um, uh, in uh, uh, East Jerusalem, and sort of the fact that uh, even though there was strong censorship, you know, of the Palestinian mobilization online, um, you know, there were still sort of ways because arguably you would find that sort of the Palestinian diaspora and those who were so somehow very much active within the cause and also very much active in terms of relaying information, you know, in a media environment that is arguably very repressed still and very sort of, um, uh, you know, that sort of has experienced limitations in terms of the local uh, communication infrastructure in occupied territories, for example. So you see how over years, generations, if you will, um, of, of constraints, repressions, and uh, uh, limitation in terms of, of freedom of expression and, and digital rights. You know, there has been sort of um, a creativity that came up amongst the diaspora, and they found ways to, for example, uh, circumvent, you know, sort of the, the censorship in some cases or the media blackout in other cases, and still sort of um, kind of draw attention to those digital rights violations, to these sort of extensive um, sort of application of, of censorship of the for Palestinian content online. So that was, um, that's an interesting case that is fairly recent. 
you know, here, for example, you have a sort of an image that displays the, you know, pa the Palestinian watermelon, which is a symbol uh, um, of um, uh, Palestinian resistance because uh, the uh, four years the Palestinian flag was not allowed to be displayed. So it became that sort of alternative, so, so that substitute, if you will, for the Palestinian flag. Um, but then, you know, what is interesting is that this in and of its own, whether it has to do with the technology or with the message itself, it shows how resilient some communities can be in terms of expressing a message that would otherwise be uh, muted, censored, or uh, repressed. Uh, so I think, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I think, again, I'm, I'm just uh, like um, keeping the discussion very sort of broad so that you can, uh, again, maybe relate to different examples you're more familiar with. But um, um, this is typically like sort of how you want to navigate this ambivalence in terms of the media, you know, like looking at it on one hand as a, as a tool for control and coercion and, and so on and so forth. And sort of it's a form of what we call typically um, uh, in sociology, um, you know, like discursive power. You know, it's like how you what we call discursive power. It's like how you gain power by shaping the public discourse, by sort of imposing a particular representation of the world as the dominant one, as the prevailing one, right? And so what is interesting is that over history, obviously, there has always been attempt at sort of uh, kind of, uh, again, reshaping, uh, reappropriating these narratives, um, kind of uh, making sense of it in a different ways, um, opposing it to alternative representations of the world, alternative views of the world uh, that sometimes also um, um, grant a voice or, you know, sort of convey the voices of those who have otherwise not been heard. So, um, you know, obviously, you know, as much as this has been extensively discussed in political communication, we also have, you know, another tradition like in cultural studies, and you probably have heard cultural studies before, typically if you're interested in media studies, um, it's kind of a, this subfield, which is also um, kind of very uh, relevant to, to the study of the media. Um, that was partly also initiated by scholars like Stuart Hall, a uh, very famous scholar. Um, and some of these, so typically these, uh, these um, sort of researchers, uh, they've also initiated a, a different sort of approach to, to the study of the media, looking into sort of the audience itself, you know? So the, the, they bring this kind of bottom-up perspective and they, they, want, they want to sort of look into um, how the audience navigates the meaning of the message, you know, like once you're exposed to a message online, do you really sort of um, take it at face value? Do you make sense of it differently? Uh, you know, obviously, um, sort of, we also we tend to think about popular culture as something that is is usually not so empowering because it, it's manufactured, it's kind of, you know, it's sort of commodified heavily, you know, it's sort of um, the culture of the masses. And um, historically, it hasn't been viewed as, as something that is, you know, empowering, that allows for people to have a voice, to feel included, and, and so on and so forth. You find a number of stereotypes typically in, in popular culture. So, so that is perhaps the more sort of negative take on popular culture in general and how the media contributes to it. But then you look at it in terms of how, you know, cultural studies, you know, sort of have approached popular culture. What they tend to say is that um, actually, yes, popular culture is in many cases the culture of the working class, is the culture of the masses, but in terms of how it's received and how it is reinterpret, in, reinterpreted and how it's kind of reappropriated, you know, people actually can still find agency with it, you know, whether it is, uh, you know, like music, uh, soap opera, sort of, you know, um, um, you know, all sorts of, even if you think about it in terms of street arts and more alternative forms of popular culture, you know, like the, very often sometimes, you know, it has also enabled people to find a voice uh, in a new way, in an innovative way. And I'm bringing this um, uh, as well, I'm sort of raising that question because I, I, I think that there's an interesting angle there to keep in mind if you look at it aside from, you know, uh, online activism, there are forms of experiences of the media that are sort of explicitly uh, political. And then you find other situations where the audience consumes the media and is exposed to, me, to, to the media. 
um, and find sort of um, its own experience of empowerment, but in a more informal way, right? So it's about sort of just enjoying popular culture and appreciating it and sort of uh, maybe, you know, sort of developing a taste for popular culture that is somehow a bit subversive, that kind of challenges the norms of what you find in, in popular culture. And that can also be quite empowering. So I'm just kind of, you know, just um, telling you about another sort of angle within media studies that can be typically very interesting if, for example, you want to um, approach that bottom up and look into sort of how it can be used uh, whether it is in activism or in sort of the representation of minorities or inclusion of minorities more specifically, whether it is in terms of um, um, kind of the diaspora media, for example, and sort of how they, um, they, they change the way we think about sort of the, uh, you know, typically uh, one too many, uh, you know, one way stream traditional uh, form of, of communication uh, in the mass media. So, you know, that these are all sort of questions that you, you might want to explore at some point. At the same time, going back to the question of digital activism in general, I wanted to sort of, uh, um, sort of draw your attention to another question, which is came up um, very, um, uh, very quickly after 2011, 2000, and, you know, the early 2010s. Uh, remember, this was the time of the Occupy Wall Street pro protest, the time of the Indi Indignados protest in Spain, the time of the Arab Spring. And um, at that time, precisely was when there was that strong assumption that technology had played a role. And then later on, you find this kind of post-colonial critique that came up. And they looked into sort of the whole uh, assumption around the role of um, technology, the, the sort of punk the, the affordances of technology potentially. And they say, well, as, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, we tend to focus too much on technology because we see technology as a driver because it kind of, you know, it evokes this, this, this sort of trope of industrial progress of scientific progress that comes back from the oral representation of modern societies. But that is a very Eurocentric way to look at it, you know, sort of that's that's how this post-colonial critique comes up um, with the, you know, sort of challenging this idea that that technology plays a significant role. And they sort of shift the focus away from the from the technology itself, from the medium to to sort of draw attention to the to the the social dynamics themselves, the social parameters. You know, it's very much about the communities and how they reinvent the media, you know? And that is, that is really interesting because it really allows you to think about media in a very broad, generic kind of way. You know, we tend to think, okay, media is TV, is radio, is the internet, but it's not, it's not just that, you know, media is, um, you know, you have to think about it in terms of any medium that is used at some point, you know, to kind of, you know, um, gain a voice uh, within the public debate, uh, feel included, sometimes even as a space of political dissent um, when um, uh, the other sort of um, uh, public spaces would be highly repressed. Um, and, and, and that can be sometimes in, in places that you might not expect, you know, you might usually not sort of consider to be a media or at least a medium for, um, uh, for public engagement. Um, so, um, I mean, I'm sure that we can all think of specific examples, <laughs> but um, I mean, even today, like, for example, uh, more recently in 2019, if I was to refer back to one of the student movements I mentioned. So in Algeria, for example, was the, you know, the Hidak, which was a, a sort of a sustained um, series of weekly street mobilizations to protest against the military regime. And what happened was that, um, you know, obviously, the, the media, you know, was, you know, it could potentially uh, phone texting and, you know, maybe at some point, you know, some phone apps did play a role, but it didn't seem to be really sort of the key of the Algerian Iraq in terms of its logistics and its sort of, um, in terms of how um, uh, protesters uh, wanted to organize and, and facilitate the, the mobilization. Mostly it was about making sure that people were on the streets, you know, sort of demonstrating peacefully on Fridays. And that allowed them to sort of um, really maintain that sort of weekly gathering over 
um, you know, almost two years, you know, um, uh, I think a uh, year and a half at least, in a number of different cities where people from different generations, from different demographics, just walk in the streets, meet, gather together. And that is interesting because today we tend to exclude, you know, offline spaces as a space for mobilization, as a media in and of its own. But it is nevertheless, you know, like if you can reappropriate the online space, sorry, offline space, you can meet in the streets, gather together, meet and sort of share your ideas um, by circumventing the gatekeeping processes that you would find otherwise in the media, then you're basically reinventing the street as a new media. And this is really interesting because, you know, you, that, that gets you to think much more creatively about media, civic movements, activism in general, and sort of how you can leverage different communication practices to, um, to sort of uh, um, facilitate uh, uh, these uh, kind of, you know, different uh, types of activism in general. Um, so yeah, that's just, just something that I wanted to uh, uh, sort of um, talk about in general and show you how, in a sense, uh, like even if we start rethinking the ways that, in which people protest today, um, like that brings us back to this post-colonial critique that came up after 2010. And we see that, uh, yes, indeed, it's not so much about the technology as we usually think about it. It's not so much about digital media or, you know, like social platforms, even. It's not so much necessarily about the crypto platforms as we have seen recently, you know, um, even encrypted platforms are uh, so sometimes uh, exposed to regulations, uh, surveillance uh, in a number of countries. Um, it's not always clear how much sort of um, these different uh, tools uh, pr protect uh, users' privacy. So I think that, um, you know, it's, it's also good to sort of maybe think about alternative spaces. And it's really hard, arguably, to think about different spaces because nowadays with the, you know, COVID and um, the ways in which, uh, you know, we interact as, as you know, we increasingly dependent on digital technologies, but still, especially at SOAS, where we tend to focus on a number of different environments and contexts where, for example, access to technology is not always available, um, and where um, offline sort of environment of social interactions are still uh, very important um, for, um, for social capital, for example, then you know that it's, it's ever it's even more important than to kind of, um, in a sense, build on that um, kind of post-colonial post critique and um, and sort of show that um, communication is not exclusively about the technology itself. So um, yeah, I think I mean there's there's a lot that you can relate to, and I mentioned a number of different examples, typically the Algerian Kirat, uh, the Palestinian, uh, the recent Palestinian. Um, mobilization online. Um, and I think, um, I'm, I'm sure that, you know, looking into a range of different examples, you would, you would find sort of um, uh, in other countries, um, sort of creative ways that people have used to sort of uh, relay their voices when uh, the prevailing media was um, securitized or uh, controlled. So, um, of course, like if you kind of go beyond this idea of technological determinism, it's not so much about the technology. Once you kind of move beyond this idea, you also have to consider social parameters that, you know, sort of play a role besides the media itself. And this is where, you know, the media studies become fascinating because you realize that it's also about the, the, the sociology of it. It's about sort of who are the people who um, can reinvent the way that we interact, the way we communicate, um, how experimental is the media that is the case, for example, for a new technology, a new media, or an emergent type of media, um, you know, sort of what is the, who are the demographics that are involved and um, how much would they be, you know, represented uh, otherwise in other types of media. So typically, if, if you sort of have more of the sociological sort of um, uh, sort of take take on um, the question of the media. That's something that would probably interest you. And also, if you have a background in political communication, you start sort of looking into different social structures. Um, you know, 
grassroots civil society organizations, for example, sometimes, um, you know, more specifically looking into the sociology of journalism, the press, you know, journalists, how they operate, how they, how they kind of make sure that they can operate within the sort of um, norms of you know, the ethics of journalism, uh, but also what conditions uh, the political economy of the media um, on a broader level. So I think, I mean, ultimately, you know, the, all of these questions, the reason why I think that they would always somehow be quite topical and they would bring you to sort of look into very topical cases is because it has to do with the way that we engage uh, questions around, you know, uh, pluralism, but also how we think about, you know, typically there are a number of very loaded terms and concepts that constantly, um, you, you, you know, that they somehow um, everywhere in the in the in social sciences, typically the concept of democracy, for example, how you think about democracy in terms of communication, who has a voice, who is included in debate, who is able to shape the debate, things like that. So you know, you you, you get to really rethink these definitions, sometimes challenge them uh, based on very recent examples. So you know, typically nowadays there's a huge question around sort of populism, right? The rise of populism. And um, or, or even sort of the you know conspiracy theories, for example, and sort of how uh, very often governments want to further regulate the media space. And so the main question is, what would be the implications of that debate, you know, elsewhere in other parts of the world, where, for example, civil society do not already, you know, they don't have the same sort of um, uh, guarantees for um, for freedom of expression. Um, so you know you. You, you constantly sort of have to navigate these big sort of questions. Okay, what is populism? What is an elitist sort of view of the media? Um, you know, like um, what are, you know, how can you sort of guarantee inclusion in the debate? You know, sort of who has a voice, who is legitimate to have a voice, who is shaping public opinion? These are very big questions and arguably, you know, it's everywhere today. Um, you know, in, top, in public policy, I think it plays a very big role, sort of how you regulate the media, uh, how you fact check information today, um, who, who should be included in that process in terms of the, the, the legitimate representatives of civil society. Um, so, so these, I think that typically, if you're interested in development, in media development, I think these are really key debates that you want to be part of. Um, and um, and I think that it's also still to, to come back to the post-colonial critique I mentioned about uh, above, it's more about um, the, the ways in which you want to demystify a number of assumptions that are still based on a very Eurocentric experience of the media and, um, and prevailed still today, whether it's in the political discourse or in the academic literature. So, you know, you would find sort of this idea that, you know, Okay, scientific and technological progress is the key. There was a strong emphasis on internet, then there's been a strong emphasis on blockchain technology more recently. Um, now there's a, you know, obviously it's, it's, it's funny because, you know, you see sort of a number of governments, for example, sort of trying to uh, uh, navigate issues about disinformation, for example, or, or deep fakes, which is sort of, you know, content that you, that you would find online and sort of how you can um, maybe, uh, uh, sort of credit the media with with more of a sense of credibility and make sure that the information is reliable. But as everyone sort of tries to make sense of these big questions, um, the problem is that there's there's still this idea that the media needs to be uh, centralized and and further regulated in the con current context, um, even when that's an argument that can be easily challenged in in other parts of the world, right? So um, this is why I think that it, it makes even more sense today to have these big discussions at SOAS. It has, it has, you know, it, it has even more value for you to have these big uh, discussions with, with sort of other uh, members of SOAS uh, academic community, interact with students from all over the world, um, and obviously just also realize how much um, sort of um, empirical evidence you can bring into the literature. You sort of say, okay, well, um, that case has not been studied. Everything tends to center on the US or the European sort of countries. Well, if we kind of look into that other sort of place and sort of show that 
that concept of disinformation, for example, doesn't work there or has its own limitation, how can we bring more nuance to this discussion and sort of make it a more multi-layered sort of um, a representation of, of, of how the media works in, in different environments, whether it's cultural or political environments, right? So um, that's why I think it, it's really exciting to, um, to sort of be part of this discussion here. And so, I mean, I think that um, overall, it kind of brings us to the question of, you know, digital activism uh, more recently, today, how does it work? There's been a lot of discussion. If you read, for example, the work of scholars like Kuteki, um, you know, and I mentioned her because she's quite popular even, you know, beyond the, the academic community. Um, you know, you may have read her book, uh, Twitter and Tear Gas. And so, um, so scholars like that, for example, they kind of become a, increasingly skeptical with online activism and they say well you know it is heavily commodified you know there's an agenda within the tech industry and the processes for which it's regulated if you look into content moderation for example it's you know it's it's very it tends to be very biased um you know um i think you would find also the work of um other scholars like uh, sofia noble for example she 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 writes um a, she wrote a book called the algorithms of oppression that you know um, talk specifically about algorithmic bias, um, and that is this. It, you know, it, it really raises very important, crucial questions about sort of how um, how much representation there is when it comes to the tech industry itself, for example, and how these new you know the technologies of tomorrow would uh, be developed, and and how this, for example, plays out in the market of big data and, and so on and so forth. So. You know, um, again, I'm kind of, you know, uh, bringing up a range of very different, very broad questions here, but it's mostly to spark your curiosity and sort of show you how crucial it is to make sense of these big questions now. Because again, if you look at it uh, from this very holistic kind of angle, then there's a lot you can do with media expertise. You can do, you can bring it in terms of you know, uh, advising policy uh, in terms of kind of making making sense of how the media should be regulated in different contexts. Uh, you can bring this into journalistic practices. Um, you know, for example, fact checking content today. Um, you know, um, kind of thinking in a more creative way about um, the the media market itself. For example, if you're interested in entrepreneurship and sort of try to think about it, an alternative model for the media, you know, support investigative journalism. So there's so much that can be done, um, especially if you cultivate that sort of um, uh, typically more um, uh, alternative um, kind of sometimes also a post-colonial perspective that gives you a fresh sort of um, uh, sort of angle on, on some of these big, big questions that I mentioned. Um, but yes, I mean, typically, so if, if on the one hand, you hear a lot of theories. Now it's almost like as if we, we hear the flip side of the coin, you know, in terms of the argument of the early 2010s. Others have said that, you know, now uh, digital, digital media activism has its limitation, of course, that because it remains a double edged sword, um, you know, it's hard to, uh, you know, arguably consolidate a movement that you know, remain sustainable um, and can bring long-term, you know, long-term uh, political change. So, it, of course, it's a big question. Then you, you would be encouraged, probably, if you start exploring these questions, you'd be encouraged to sort of um, kind of think about how, how the media, you know, kind of Inter intersect with other practices of uh, political activism in, in civil movements, and sort of whether you know uh, there's, a, there's a whether the social dynamics that you know, the social parameters basically um, you know that play out beyond the question of the media, whether you know these are sort of the, the crucial sort of part that explains the sustainability of civil movements, their long term you know uh, kind of benefits sort of how whether they are able to change society to sort of advocate for structural changes and quite you know especially around questions of inequalities so these are you know some of the very broad <laughs> um sort of topics that you will have the chance to uh, to research and 
and explore. So um, I'm gonna I'm gonna conclude right now and sort of invite you to ask questions or maybe sort of share some ideas, uh, maybe react or comment from anything that I've said or um, you know uh, feel free to to just come up with your own um, with your own input. Please don't be shy, feel free to raise your hand or even just post on the chat um, if you're too shy at this stage. Um, it's always nice to hear your voices because I feel less lonely in the Zoom session, but um, whatever's comfortable for you. Hi everybody, do feel free to drop a message into the chat box if you'd like to raise a question or alternatively, um, you can always do the raise hand function um, and then we'll know that you wanna ask a question and uh, we can invite you to unmute yourselves. It's always hard to be the first person to ask a question. All right, so I see one question that has been posted in the chat uh, from Neha. Um, Hi, I'm Neha from India. How can we look at COVID-19 from a de-westernized perspective? Okay, so thanks for the question. Um, so typically, if, if you were to look at it in the, you know, in the context of the, the media, I think, I mean, what is fascinating, and these are typically some of the discussions we've had recently with, with or students um, that are currently finishing the program this, this academic year, it's very much about, like some of the, the main focus was very much on sort of how COVID-19 seems to have sort of uh, slowed down some of the mobilizations that you know, we've seen in, in other parts of the world. So of course I mentioned sort of Lebanon, typically Algeria, you know, Sudan is a, is a kind of started, the time frame was a bit different arguably, but, but then you can also, I suppose also, you know, mention the, the case of the farmers protest, for example, in India. So I think what is really sort of uh, problematic with COVID-19 on, on, on the one hand, is that you know it, it sort of um, creates you know especially with you know concerns which you know obviously are legitimate concerns about conspiracy theories in, in some parts of the world but at the same time also sort of create more grounds for um, uh, further regulations in environments where the media is already very centralized uh, if you will so it's always about sort of making sense of that conundrum and sort of how you know, typically terms like disinformation, for example, or conspiracy theories and, and sort of, epi, you know, for example, the epidemic, the case in the previous case of the epidemic, you know, this has led to a new term in communication um, that was used recently, which is infodemic. So the fact that obviously there was an, <laughs> you know, it was, the idea was that it was an epidemic of disinformation, if you will. So obviously now communication scholars are very sort of interested in that sort of idea of an infodemic, but the real uh, challenge is to make sense of that conundrum where in, in, you know, in some parts of the world, obviously the, the, the regulation of and recentralization of the media may be you know, legitimate. You know, it kind of makes sense in that if you, if you sort of place it back into the context of the rise of the far right, the rise of populist rhetoric on the one hand, but then in other parts of the world, it might also kind of be detrimental to, you know, um, civil society. So, so this was typically something that was extensively discussed and debated, um, you know, in our um, group discussions with students. And I think it was, it was really fascinating to, to hear from everyone's uh, input, because as you can obviously imagine, as you know, um, you know, we, we have this very international community and, and everyone comes up with, you know, uh, evidence from everywhere across the world. So, um, yeah, we had students from uh, Hong Kong, typically in Vietnam, from uh, Myanmar, from Kashmir, from, um, from India as well. From, you know, so it's, it's, it's really fascinating to kind of really compare and, and contrast these different perspectives. You're welcome. <laughs> So again, I know it's, it can be a bit intimidating, but uh, if any 
anyone else wants to ask a question, feel free to um, post something again in the chat or just raise your hand, it's just fine. All right, so I see another question here from Boni, thanks. I'm interested in online activism and emotional mobilization on social media. May I ask, um, is that the PowerPoint? No, oh, the PowerPoint, yes, of course. Yes, the PowerPoint, I'm happy to share the PowerPoint. Um, this is, um, you know, it just gives you some references to a range of different sort of theories, you know, that talk about it. But obviously it's, it's not, um, you know, it's, it's not always the most relevant to your own interests. And that's what's really a great starting next year, hopefully, you know, like um, if, uh, if you get to, to really start with a program, you, you can start, you can sort of um, tailor your own case studies in different sort of um, assignments. And that gives you the opportunity to personalize your uh, approach to the, to the subject and, and just decide, okay, I, I wanna look into this country or this particular campaign, or I wanna compare those two places. And, and then you get to really uh, narrow down your focus to uh, the key sort of sources and, and references that might be interested for, interesting for you or rel most relevant for you. Um, and then uh, let me just read your next question. So, struggling with the technology. Also, how do you think the rational de um, deliberation, which features the classic public sphere now, could fit into the social media with actors? So that's a uh, brilliant question, really brilliant question. Um, I didn't really enter the specifics of that debate because um, I don't know how familiar everyone here is with, with these big concepts. But yeah, there is that sort of typically more classic Eurocentric notion of the public sphere. And we're going to briefly sort of acknowledge that this exists and that this prevails in the, in the literature simply because obviously you would come across that sort of notion. And it is, you know, arguably it's everywhere in the debate. It's everywhere in the Nowadays, typically, if you read about what policymakers write about disinformation and how they plan to tackle it and how they sort of define it, you know, in the, from their own sort of perspective in terms of, you know, gaining more legitimacy as the sort of um, um, source, you know, the more sort of official source, the, the sort of um, uh, expert knowledge on, on, on a number of subjects, for example, um, sort of uh, um, even when it comes to the mainstream media, sort of reclaiming its own credibility and legitimacy, everything that you read today, arguably, um, would, would bring you back to that notion that there is a public sphere and the media is central to that public sphere. And, you know, it's very much about sort of intellectuals and well-informed people and journalists, qualifying journalists that provide you with reliable information. And what is really interesting is if you actually look beyond the Eurocentric model, you look into sort of countries where you have informal communication networks that are much more important to the social capital because there's more credibility there and people kind of, they fact check the news in a very organic way by relying on each other, by sharing information uh, from one another. And, it's, and even interpersonal communication on that. And so, you know, I'm sure that when it comes to uh, activism in general, whether it's social media activism or whether it is, you know, other forms of activism that, you know, amongst other things include social media, um, you know, you have to think about it this way, you know, that, that sometimes that sort of these informal networks, these sort of community based sort of networks where information circulates that that some sometimes it creates more sort of sense of public trust. Um, and it's, um, it's fascinating to contrast that with what we usually hear about when it comes to the classic public sphere. Because I, yeah. So uh, hopefully, um, yeah, you get to um, explore further um, next year and maybe in, in your own readings. Amazing, I'm, I'm happy you enjoyed. Um, so I think we only have 10 minutes left, but feel free um, if anybody else wants to maybe share some thoughts or, um, you know, if, if that triggers a reaction, if there's something that, you know, something you feel, wow, we didn't, you know, 
we didn't mention that, we didn't talk about that. I mean, it seems important to me. I just want to share this. Feel free to do so. And so, so your own space, obviously. So um, it's nice to, um, to hear your, your contribution. Um, and otherwise, I mean, if, if you feel that, uh, you know, that was kind of, um, kind of, if, if you feel that covered enough for today, uh, I'm happy to, to conclude the session, but I just want to make sure that you have a, an opportunity to ask a question. Yeah, we probably have time for at least one more question. So do feel free to either add it into the chat box or simply raise your hand um, and we'll be able to invite you to unmute yourselves. Digital society with COVID-19. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah, so... Um, I, that kind of relates back to your earlier question there, I think, um, sort of general thoughts, uh, just to make sure, like, are you, are you asking, are you asking me my own thoughts, or are you asking everyone else to sort of share their thoughts on, on the topic, or? This question of digital society, I mean, um, typically, I think that the quote that um, I posted uh, in my presentation from from Castell, you know, like this was a this was a time back in in the early 2010 when you know this, this concept was initially you know Castell came up with this concept, this notion of um, you know um, uh, more specifically the network society, right? Network society and sort of how now everything seems to be sort of articulated and sort of designed around this notion of a, a network society. Um, yeah, in a, in a sense, I think that it's still the case, arguably, but, but it's, it can be sometimes useful to think about it outside of digital media, right? It's not necessarily specific to digital media. Um, I can see, uh, can see your next question. So how did the leadership worldwide handle this on social media uh, they, in terms of their communication and governance? Um, I think, um, yeah, I think in a sense that kind of relates back to, um, you know, what I mentioned just briefly earlier, uh, sort of how now there's this um, sort of intent to, to further regulate, centralize the debate, you know, sort of people are being warned in, in sort of um, awareness campaigns about uh, disinformation, about conspiracy theories, um, you know, it, it has, a, it, you know, arguably, yes, it has, a, it had a, a very critical impact uh, on the um, on the epidemic. Uh, you know, people came up with this concept of infodemic, for example, um, uh, which which is worth sort of tackling uh, in one way or another. But at the same time, um, you know, in other parts of the world, it has also been used to to further securitize uh, social media, and, and and so and so. The real question is is that of public trust, right? That's also something else we're gonna talk about uh, typically in, the, in this program is, is sort of um, what type of information do people trust? And, and if we're in the context of public distrust, what is it that caused these, this public distrust? What are the real factors? Because you could argue that in a sense nowadays, there's, there's a big sort of intention to, to sort of tackle issues around disinformation, for example, conspiracy theories, and that has been the case in the context of the epidemic. And then at the same time, you know, there's also a sense that causes of public distrust have not always been appropriately, you know, properly addressed in different contexts. So. Um, Neda, I'm just reading your, your post. So, um, I wanted to know whether you think there's a difference between uh, media and journalism today. Um, this is actually a very common discussion here in India about the Indian media owing to its institution, uh, structures, business, um, interest. I would love to know your take on this. Um, yeah, it seems to be a typically um, a question that sort of looks into the political economy uh, of the media, which I mentioned. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, that's actually a big part of the discussion in media communication. So what's the media ownership concentration in one country, you know, sort of, um, 
is the ruling, ruling elite that has more control over the media? Um, are there a number of different actors that have a sort of monopoly over the media market, over the local media market? Um, you know, you can find a number of indicators that, you know, typically um, sort of um, human rights advocates or, um, you know, uh, organizations that work uh, in terms of um, advocacy around freedom of the press, they look into these specific parameters in a number of different countries, sort of what's the degree of uh, media ownership concentration. Um, so that's typically something you could look, you could uh, sort of explore in India. And how much does this sort of um, control public opinion? How much does this shape public opinion in a particular context uh, in favor of the ruling elite? Um, and then also, obviously, how detrimental is it to the independent media sphere? What, what place is left for the, for the independent media or um, sort of uh, local sort of uh, media that may not rely on the same sources of um, funding, for example. Um, so, so this is a this is huge, sort of very big debate. Typically, in, in media and development, you have the opportunity to study that, I guess. Um, but it's it's definitely very relevant to the the program overall. Okay. So I think that we're kind of reaching the last two minutes of the session. Um, to have the chance to conclude, I just want to say that uh, it was my pleasure to present to you um, kind of a, <laughs> a teaser of the, um, of the module, um, I mean, the range of modules that we teach. And um, thank you for your, for your questions and your reaction. It was really nice to, um, to sort of stimulate some, some kind of interest and, um, and a range of, of different questions, stimulate your curiosity on the topic. So thank you again, and uh, hopefully I will meet you in, uh, in other circumstances. Thank you everybody for listening in today. Um, we will have some follow-up sessions um, coming in the next couple of months. So uh, do look out for emails around those sessions. And of course we did record today's session uh, so we will be sending links of that out in case you want to um, re-watch the session um, or in case you weren't able to join at the start of the session today.